Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the book of Hebrews. It's entitled, In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. Hmm. Well, this is lesson number 11 in that series from March 12 of 2022, entitled, Jesus, Author and Perfecter of Our Faith. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have gathered here to talk about you and to talk about what was written probably by your friend Paul many, many years ago. He talks as if it was the last days in his day, and now almost 2,000 years have gone by, and surely it must be the last days in which we are living. Help us to be prepared, as he suggested, in these uh, studies is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you might guess that if we're talking about the last two or three chapters of Hebrews, we would be discussing the great subject of faith. Hebrews 11 and 12 were probably the most loved chapters in the book. They describe the Christian life as a race in which we all participate and which all who stay faithful will receive the reward. They also describe the drama of redemption as a race in which people of faith from the past persevered despite sufferings but have not yet received the reward. And that's because the story ends with us as well, not just them. We are the concluding act. Do you all feel like actors? The drama culminates with our enter entering and running the last part of the race. And with Jesus seated at the goal line at the right hand of God, he provides inspiration as well as the ultimate example of how the race is run. He is the ultimate witness that the reward is true and that he is the forerunner who opens the way for us. And that's summarizing the teachings of Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, and then Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. That's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sabbath afternoon of March 5. We hope you had a chance to look at that. What is faith? Now we have a definition. There's a lot of choices. Many people have very different ideas about what faith is. Jim, can you help us there? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. To have faith is to be sure of the things that we hope for, so that to be certain of the things we cannot see. American Bible Society, 1992. Okay. Based on the scripture, a biblical definition of faith stated so well, so many times, by one of God's best modern friends, A. Graham Maxwell. Faith is just a word we use to denote a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better relationship may be. We cannot say will be. will be because we know the story of Lucifer. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deep admiration. It means having enough confidence in him based upon the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe whatever he says he soon, excuse me, as soon as we are sure that he is the one who ha has said it, to accept whatever he offers as soon as we are sure that he is the one who is offering it, and to do whatever he wishes as soon as we are sure that he is the one who wishes it without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith is perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means that like Abraham, Job, and Moses, God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. Why? A. Graham Maxwell, You Can Trust the Bible, page 81. Okay, and sections in there and brackets are added based on many discussions with him and classes and so forth. So, if that's a definition of faith, we would say, and I'm going to illustrate it like this, faith is whatever takes us closer to God, and sin is whatever takes us away from God. And we'll see that those two things are direct opposites as rep represented by re Romans 14, 23. 
So in this lesson, we examined several great and some surprising examples of faith, ending with the greatest example of all, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to live by faith? It means to look past immediate circumstances and troubles. It means to take the larger, great controversy view of the history of our world, especially as we approach the end of time. Now let me give you a very simple, straightforward example of that. There are many Christians who think that it, it's, it's heresy to say a person is safe to save. We just read that here. They think it's heresy, that it's only because what Christ has done for us, that he pays the penalty and so forth, like that there's no way we can be safe to save. It's just Jesus somehow does it even though we're not safe to save. And that, of course, suggests that they haven't thought of the larger context. We're talking about people who hopefully are preparing to live forever in the heavenly context not just this short life here. Their focus is on what's going on right now in this life. We want to focus on what's going to happen for the rest of eternity. And, and to push it a little further, uh, I'm sure we uh, have friends who say, once you're saved, no one can unsave you. Mm -hmm. That's it, you're done. Yeah. yeah. Well, Charles, I'm, I'm sorry, Kerry, Hebrews 10. Reading from Hebrews 10, verses 35 through 39. Do not lose your courage then, because it brings with it a great reward. You need to be patient in order to do the will of God and receive what he promises. For, as the scripture says, just a little while longer and he who is coming will come. He will not delay. Now, 2,000 years later, would you say he's delayed? <laughs> well, go ahead. Uh, now he's quoting, though. He's quoting yeah. from the Old Testament. He's quoting so from the Old Testament. Back. So it's even yeah. further back. That's right. right. My righteous people, however, will believe and live. But if any of them turns back, I will not be pleased with him. We are not people who turn back and are lost. Instead, we have faith and are saved, and that's from the Good News Bible. Okay. Now, of course, the Old Testament people did see the first coming of Jesus Christ. Did they think it was delayed? Well, maybe so. One of the important characteristics of faith is endurance. Those who have faith that are willing to put up with current difficulty, difficult times and difficult situations because they have in view that longer term guaranteed result at the end, they trust the God they have come to know. Look at a couple of challenges that emphasize that point in Revelation 13 and 14. One from 13, one from 14. Duane? Revelation 13, 10. Whoever is meant to be captured will surely be captured. Whoever is meant to be killed by the sword will surely be killed by the sword. This calls for endurance and faith on the part of God's people. And let me interrupt for a second. Five verses later, he says, this is of course the devil speaking, he says, anybody who doesn't join my side in the great controversy will be killed. So that's a, something to worry about. Okay, go ahead. And Revelation 14, 12. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Okay, so Satan is saying, well, Satan, we have Satan's side presented and Revelation says, this calls for endurance. And then we hear God's response of Revelation 14, one to 12, but especially uh, six to 12, the, the three angels messages. And again, it says this calls for endurance. So that should be a warning, shouldn't it? It's not always easy to hold on to the hope which we have, but that is our challenge. Charles, Hebrews 10 and following. Let us hold on firmly to the hope we profess because we can trust God to keep his promises. Hebrews 4, 14, let us then hold firmly to the faith we possess for we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, Jesus 
the Son of God. So hold on firmly to what you profess, okay? Paul was a great student of the Old Testament. Having probably memorized great portions of it, if not all of it, in the original Hebrew. So he chooses the experience of Habakkuk to introduce his discussion of faith. Now Habakkuk lived in Judah during the final days before the Babylonian captivity. His prophecy was probably written about 25 years before Nebuchadnezzar's first invasion in 605 BC. But as Habakkuk and others saw the rise of the Babylonian nation and their conquering of other nations, he feared what was coming. Notice his comments and his questions for God. Habakkuk, now we're turning to that small book in the Old Testament, Habakkuk 1, 12 to 17. Lord, from the very beginning, you are God. You are my God, holy and eternal. Lord, my God and protector, you have chosen the Babylonians and made them strong so that they can punish us? But how can you stand these treacherous evil men? Your eyes are too holy to look on evil or look at evil, and you cannot stand the sight of people doing wrong, so why are you silent while well, they destroy people who are more righteous than they are? How can you treat people like fish or like a swarm of insects that have no, no ruler to direct them? The Babylonians catch people with hooks as though they were fish. They drag them off in nets and, shoot, and shout for joy over their catch. They even worship their nets and offer sacrifices to them because their nets provide them with the best of everything. Are they going, going to use their swords forever and keep on destroying nations without mercy? So then God responds, and now we're getting into the thick of it. Jim? Habakkuk 2, verses 2 to 4. The Lord gave me this answer. Write down clearly on clay tablets what I re reveal to you so that it can be read at a glance. Put it in writing, because it is not yet time for it to come true. But the time is coming quickly, and, that, and what I show you will come true. It may seem slow in coming, but wait for it. It will certainly take place, and it will not be delayed. And this is the message. Those who are evil will not survive, but those who are righteous will live because they are faithful to God. Good News Bible. Those who are righteous. Paul loved that sentence there. Those who are righteous will live because they are faithful to God. And he quotes it in several different places. The most famous, of course, is in Romans 1. Just, just, As, yeah. just a little sideline. Uh, come to think, this is world power, yeah. Babylon. World power. Well, uh, several hundred years earlier was another world power, Egypt. Mm -hmm. Who was the boss? Moses. Mm -hmm. Come to think. Mm -hmm. And here, Habakkuk is talking about, Lord, why? Why this? Before long, it, Nebuchadnezzar is writing Daniel chapter 4. Mm -hmm. And 120 provinces all the way to India. Mm -hmm. And who are the top guys? Did the, was the Lord able to do that with Israel themselves? You know, that's what we wonder. Yeah. So uh, there was a time when David ruled almost all the way yeah. from Egypt to Euphrates. Yeah. Right, right. Was, as a result of his interactions with God, Habakkuk realized that he was living between the days of God's promises and their fulfillment. You're in that catchment period, as we say in modern terms. Yeah, because Christ came, what, about 600 years after that? Or yep. So? 620 uh, some years later, one, he was one, born. And then the quick thing, Nebuchadnezzar just took over the Babylonian empire yeah. and he invaded. So he already knew what he was going to do. 605. Well, his father, his father yes. Nabopolassar had been conquering nations all over the place. And when Nabopolassar died, Nebuchadnezzar was ready to go. Just gonna go to keep it up. Keep it up. Yeah. Habakkuk realized he was living between the days of God's promises and their fulfillment. Would that apply to us as well as we wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ? I think so. I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37. For as the scripture says, just a little while longer, and he who is coming will come. 
He will not delay, and that's from the Good News Bible. So the fact that there might, there's some question about delay must be why God is keeps saying, well, there won't be any delay, there won't be any delay. But from our perspective, our short lifespans, yeah. it may seem like there's a real delay. Yeah. How, does, how does that fit with our understanding that there has been long delay in our day? We need to remember that following the prophecies of Habakkuk, Jesus did not come the first time until 600 years, after 600 years. However, now it has been almost 2,000 years since his first coming and the writings of Paul and the other writers of the New Testament. Okay, so what does Ellen White say about that, Duane? The long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy. Because if the Master should come, so many would be found unready. God's unwillingness to have his people perish has been the reason of so long delay. Hmm. Okay, that was written in Ellen White's Testimonies to the Church back in 1868. 1868. 24 years after the Great Disappointment. Yeah. 24 years after the great disappointment and she talks about long delay well what would what would she say today hmm. this is why God has called us to live by faith if we could take the larger view and not become embroiled in and discouraged by issues that surround us day by day we will see that God's plan has an ultimate goal and we are a part of it and how do we know for sure that God is going to win in the end? Hebrews 10, 38. My righteous people, however, will believe and live. But if any of them turns back, I will not be pleased with him. Okay, and then quoting directly from Habakkuk, Romans 1. You want to go ahead and read that? 16 to 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For in the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Okay, it's very interesting that it's possible in Greek to construct a sentence so that uh, you can't tell for sure whether it means he who through faith is righteous is going to live, or whether it means he with their face will live because of his, uh, I mean, he who is righteous will live because of his faith. So is he living because of his faith, or is he righteous because of his faith, or probably what Paul intended intentionally was that both. Yeah, he's righteous because of his faith, and he's going to live because of his faith. That's from the Revised Standard Version. What is the righteousness of God? Now he's talking about the righteousness of God here. What does that have to do with anything? Does it have something to do with our salvation? We believe that the gospel is all about the righteousness of God. Amen. That is the end goal towards which we are moving. Ultimately, that will be the guarantee of our salvation and God's rule forever. Do you feel comfortable with God's promises to us? Do you feel that they are absolutely certain? Or do you have some questions about them? Let us turn to consider some of the faithful mention, faithful mentioned in Hebrews 11, the so-called faith chapter. Now we're going to look at Hebrews 11, the first 19 verses. And these are familiar, probably if you have been around Christian institutions and schools and so forth, you probably memorized several of these, maybe the whole thing. Once again, to have faith is to be sure of the things, sorry, to have faith is to be uh, sure of the things we hope for, to be certain of the things we cannot see. It was by faith that pe uh, it was by their faith that people of ancient times won God's approval. It is by faith that we understand that the universe was created by God's word so that what can be seen was made out of what cannot be seen, and of course, we immediately think about the theories of evolution and so forth. It was faith that made Abel offer to God a better sacrifice than Cain's. Through his faith, he won God's approval as a righteous man because God himself approved of his gifts. 
by means of his faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. It was faith that kept Enoch from dying. Instead, he was taken up to God and nobody could find him because God had taken him up. And Ellen White talks about the fact that they thought, surely if God took him up, he must have put him down somewhere else. They were searching all over the place looking for Enoch. It wasn't there. And you've probably heard the story about the young boy who says that Enoch was walking with God and one day God just says, well, it's closer to my house than it is to your house. Why don't we just go to my house? <laughs> because God has taken him up. The scripture says that before Enoch was taken up, he had pleased God. No one can please God without faith, for whoever comes to God must have faith that God exists and rewards those who seek him. It was faith that made Noah hear God's warnings about things in the future that he could not see. He obeyed God and built a boat in which he and his family were saved. As a result, the world was condemned and Noah received from God the righteousness that comes by faith. It was faith that made Abraham obey when God called him to go out to a country which God had promised to give him. He left his own country without knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as a foreigner in the country that God had promised him. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who received the same promise from God. For Abraham was waiting for the city which God has designed and built, the city with permanent foundations. It was faith that made Abraham able to become a father, even though he was too old and Sarah herself could not have children. He trusted God to keep his promise. Though Abraham was practically dead, from this one man came as many descendants as there are stars in the sky, as many as the numberless grains of sand on the seashore. It was faith that all these, it was in faith that all these people died. So when you say they died in faith, what are we implying? Well, they yes, trusted, they, they placed their trust in yes. God for something that was still coming. Yes. Hadn't come yet, but it was coming, right? They did not receive the things God had promised, but from a long way off they saw them and welcomed them and admitted openly that they were foreigners and refugees on earth. Those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. And would that be true of us as well? Are we looking for a country of our own? Mm. They did not keep thinking about the country they had left. If they had, they would have had the chance to return. And we know in Abraham's family, there were several times when people went back. You know, the Abraham's servant went back and got a wife for Isaac and Jacob when he was running from his brother, went back and came back with four wives, or two wives and two concubines, or however you want to count those people. Instead, it was a better country they longed for, the heavenly country, and so God is not ashamed for them to call him their God because he has prepared a city for them. God has prepared a city for them. And do we have the opportunity of claiming a, part, a place in that city? We do. It was faith that made Abraham offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice when God put Abraham to the test. And of course, in the New Testament, and even other parts of the Old Testament, that is considered the ultimate test of faith. God, Abraham was willing to do that. Abraham was the one to whom God had made the promise, yet he was ready to offer his only son as a sacrifice. Didn't Abraham have another son? Yes. <laughs> not the son of the promise. He was the only son of the promise. God had said to him, it is through Isaac that you will have the descendants I promised. Abraham reckoned that God was able to raise Isaac from death. And so to speak, Abraham did receive Isaac back from death. So to the Jewish audience, Abraham was, is the ultimate example of faith. That's still, that's still true. How did you qualify for that distinction? We know that on several occasions, Abraham had, mis Abraham had misrepresented the truth by lying about his wife and got her to cooperate with him in the lying business. He did not trust God to provide the son he, ho he had hoped for, he hoped for, but ultimately he was willing to take the 20 -year -old, that 20 year old son on that three day journey to offer him an altar on Mount Moriah. And you know, Abraham was 120 years old, and I, I know things were different in those days, but I mean, Isaac was 20, 
If he had wanted to run away, he certainly could have, at any point, I'm sure. Clearly, that was an example of not panicking because of what seemed to be the obvious disaster in the situation in which one is entwined at the moment, but looking at the longer, larger goal and the promise of God. The whole story, of course, is found in Genesis 22. After three days of walking all day and praying with God all night, God, why are you asking me to do this? What's going on? Why do you want this? Abraham was prepared to do what God asked him to do. He had worked it out in his mind that God would either offer a substitute or bring his son Isaac back to life. Hebrews 11, 19. Thus, Abraham trusted God. And trust, of course, is another word for faith. Okay, so now what do you think? Does the story of Abraham help your faith? It should. Yes. Yeah. I think it should. Yes. It's very interesting if you have an opportunity to read the book Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 154 and 155. It says there that this was not only for the benefit of Abraham and his descendants, but everyone after that, and not only them, but for the, all the beings in the rest of the universe because it prevented before them more clearly the challenge of what God is ultimately gonna do be after that in offering his only son. So this is a lesson book for the universe, in addition to us, of course. Um, and that was, that was intentional. I also feel that uh, Abraham needed to know that he was credible, that he could be trusted on, because he goofed up so badly. Mm -hmm. Even his wife says, come on, take my hands made. You know, yeah. the Lord could have intervened, he didn't. No. Uh, he had his own reasons, but now he says, okay, Abraham, I'd like for you to know that you will stand for and do this. Yeah. Well, the next major example in Hebrews 11 is the story of Moses. Think of the story of Moses. He was supposed to have been killed at his birth. Every male child was supposed to be thrown into the river. Instead, he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. After 12 years of education by his Hebrew parents, because the daughter, Pharaoh's daughter didn't have any way of keeping him alive, so he was raised by his parents. He was taken to the palace of Pharaoh. For the next 28 years, he was trained to be the next Pharaoh. At that point in history, Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world. But based on what he knew about God's promises, Moses chose to associate with the children of Israel rather than remain in Egypt. And you can read about that in verses 20 through 28 in Hebrews 11. So at his day, Paul was writing to a group of challenged young people. Some of them were apostatizing, others had questions. So it reminded them of Moses' story. Moses did not even start his major task in life until he was 80 years old. That gives hope for some of the rest of us here. Mm -hmm. And just imagine the incredible experiences Moses went through in those next 40 years. Well, many of the original readers of Hebrews, as well as Moses and the others we read about in Hebrews 11, faced suffering, some faced death. There are definitely Christians suffering for, the, for their faith in parts of our world today. But for those of us living in the more financially successful nations in the world, we're, we're, we're pretty comfortable. Are we too comfortable? Would we be suffering more if we were more vigorous with our witnessing? Hmm. In the first portion of Hebrews 11, we read that the stories are great examples of faith, and suddenly there's a change in the narrative. What happens? Well, why was Rahab, a pagan prostitute, included in this text of sacred biblical examples? I mean, here we have Noah, and we have Abraham, and we have Moses, and Rahab? Where did she come from? And even bypassing Joshua put yeah. Rahab there. Well, <laughs> look at this. It was faith that made the walls of Jericho fall down after the Israelites had marched around them for seven days. And it's very interesting to notice that uh, those who did have done careful research, archaeological research on the book, on the old city, what's left of that city of, of Jericho, 
all, all the wall didn't fall down. All the walls didn't fall down. There was still that part of the wall where Rahab could have a home. The walls fell outward instead of inward, so they filled up the, the gaps that supposedly were, were supposed to prevent anybody from entering the city. The whole, everything happened there just exactly the way God planned it. There were two walls, right? Oh yeah, there were two walls. Oh yes, yeah. Well, here we go, Hebrews 11, 30 and 31. It was faith that made the walls of Jericho fall down after the Israelites had marched around them for seven days. You can imagine, I mean, it's not, I mean, Jericho was not a huge city, but it probably must have taken, taken them half an hour or three quarters of an hour, maybe an hour, to walk around it each time. And all the children of Israel were supposed to be marching around there. And can you imagine the kids, okay, okay, mom, we did this already two times. Do we need to do it again? Again, again, again. I mean, even some of the adults probably started thinking, hmm, <laughs> how many times do we need to do this? Well, seven times. It was faith, seven days first and then seven times on the last day. It was faith that kept the prostitute Rahab from being killed with those who disobeyed God, for she gave the Israelite spies a friendly welcome. Rahab is probably the most unexpected character whom we find in Hebrews 11. Rahab is one of two women mentioned by name. She is the tenth in the list, the first being forefathers and patriarchs of Israel. And each one is regarded as being righteous. When we come to her, we find that she's not only righteous, she's what? <laughs> she's not only a woman, but is a Gentile prostitute. That's not exactly where you go looking for your righteous people, is it? And she ended up being one of the ancestors of Jesus. Hmm. Who is the other lady, Ruth, by the chance? Or what? Who is the other lady, Ruth? N not Ruth? the ones that are mentioned here. Oh no, Sarah. No, okay, the Sarah. ones that are mentioned. It, yeah. If you go, if you go to Matthew one, where it talks about the ancestors of Jesus, there are four of them, all of them with interesting, colorful past. Yeah, I was just thinking, because Ruth is also one Moabite, you know, so she yeah. didn't come from. Yeah. The most surprising thing is that she also is a thematic center and climax of the chapter. The list is organized in a unique way. Each entry begins with the repetitive use of the phrase, by faith. The basic pattern is, by faith, so-and-so did such-and-such or by faith such and such happened to so and so. This repetitive pattern increases the expectation in the reader to hear the climatic assertion that by faith Joshua led the people into the promised land. But that's not what the text says. Instead, Joshua is passed over and the prostitute takes his place, the Gentile prostitute. After the mention of Rahab, the repetitive pattern ends abruptly with and what more shall I say? Hebrews 11, verse 32. Then Paul hurriedly lists some names and events that he does not explain in detail. Rahab's deed of faith was that she heard, believed, and obeyed, even though she did not see. Okay, what did she hear? Let's see how good we are, our memories are of this story. Egypt. She heard all that she heard about what the Israelites had done getting out of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, conquering, two kings. conquering those two northern kings and like this. She says, we've all heard about it. So she believed, because mm -hmm. I, I, I've, not, I've not heard of any other so-called gods that have been able to do all those things. This, is, this the guy is different and obeyed, even though she did not see. She did not see the plagues of Egypt, or the deliverance in the Red Sea, or the water flow from the rock, or the bread descend from heaven, yet she believed. She was a good exemplar for the audience of Hebrews, who did not hear Jesus preach or see him do a miracle, and for us as well, who did not see any of these things either. That's our Bible study guide for Wednesday, March 9. Rahab was a harlot who lived in the wall of Jericho and she lived in a place where prostitution and all sorts of evil kinds of behaviors, it was the order of the day. Everybody was doing that kind of stuff. She hid the two Israelite spies sent to check out the defenses of that city. 
because of her kindness to them and her declaration of belief in God, the spies promised that the lives of Rahab and her family would be spared when the attack came on Jericho. That's, I think there's a lesson to take from here, I mean, yeah. in that um, here, was, here was Rahab, she knew her, she had a problem, but she believed, mm -hmm. she believed she had a problem. We go to the New Testament, the lady who was so blessed, she saw Christ in his real divine beauty, and she had a problem. And the Lord knew that she loved him dearly, and she also, he also knew that she had a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I think modern day application, people who knowingly do things and they hide, and they can be holding offices all over, even in the highest places of the church. Yeah. And when they're caught red-handed, that's when, but these folk knew that they had a problem, but they loved the Lord dearly. Yeah. Dearly, they didn't fake, they, didn't, they were not fake people. I remember what one medical student said about that story, Rahab, you know, she rushed, ush, rushed those two spies up on the roof and hit them under the hay. And Dr. Maxwell used to ask the medical students, okay, if you were there hiding under the hay, what would you, what would you be praying for? Because the, the, the soldiers came to the door, said, you know, did you, did you have any guys here, whatever? And I don't know for sure what she said, but what would you be praying if you were hiding under the hay? Were you, would you be praying for her to tell the truth? <laughs> One medical student said he would be praying, help me not to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> help me not to sneeze. <laughs> Well, having shifted his discussion from the heroes, Paul listed an interesting group of Old Testament characters. But first he talked about some of the incredible experiences some of them had passed through. Hebrews 11, 35 to 38. Okay, who's next here? I think it's, I think it's Jim. I think it's me. Through faith, women received their dead relatives raised back to life. Others refusing to accept freedom, died under torture in order to be raised to a better life. Hmm. Some were mocked and whipped. Others were put in chains and taken off to prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went around clothed in skins of sheep or goats, poor, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world has not got, the world has not was, good enough. Was not. To, world was not good enough for them. They wandered like refugees in the desert and hills, living in caves and holes in the ground. Good News Bible. Wow. This sawed into two, was it thinking about Isaiah? That's Isaiah. There's an actual story in the pseudepigraphical books called The Martyrdom of Isaiah. And he was, he was, according to that book, and I don't know how reliable it is, According to that book, Isaiah was actually trying to hide mm. in, inside of a hollow tree. But a little part of his, his uh, gown was showed out through the bottom, and they caught him and sawed the log in half with him in there. Can you imagine that? That was Manasseh, the King Manasseh, the wonderful King Manasseh. Well, did, those, did these experiences make you want to go back and review the Old Testament? Lots of challenging stories in the Old Testament. Well, going on there, Carrie? I'm reading from Hebrews 11, verse 32. Should I go on? There isn't enough time for me to speak of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. It's from the Good News Bible. Okay. Would you have chosen that list as being your great examples of faith from the Old Testament? <laughs> wow. Samson, Barak, Gideon, Jephthah, wow. Finally, Paul turned to the real example of faith and endurance, Jesus Christ himself, and that, of course, is spilling over into Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Duane? As for us, we have this large crowd of witnesses around us. So then, let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way and of the sin which holds on to us so tightly and let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross. 
On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross. And he is now seated at the right hand side of God's throne. Think of what he went through, how he would have put up with so much hatred from sinners. So do not let yourselves become discouraged and give up. Okay. Charles, you want to pick up the next? In the Garden of Gethsemane, with the issues of the conflict before him, Christ's soul was filled with dread of separation from God. Now let's stop there for a second. There's a word the Bible uses to describe separation from God. What is it? Sin? Uh, well, sin leads to it, but God's response to that is called God's wrath. wrath. So Jesus is worried about separation from God. He's not worried about sweating drops of blood, which he's doing right at that point in time. He's not worried about the anxiety. He's not worrying about the fact that he knows he's about ready to be beaten and, and whipped and, and crown of thorns on his head and crucified. He's worried about what? Separation. Separation from his father. Okay. Uh, Christ's soul was filled with dread of separation from God. Satan told him that if he would become the surety for a sinful world, the separation would be eternal. See, that's Satan's thing. Says, if you go through with this and you experience the, ex have the experiences as if you were a sinner and you allowed yourself to be completely separated from the Father, it's going to be all over for you. Mm. There will be no resurrection. That was Satan's claim. He'd be identified with Satan's kingdom and would remove, nevermore, be one with God. Helen White, Desire of Ages 686, uh, paragraph 5. As Jesus was dying, Satan was in his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave as conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Okay, so Satan was, that's what Satan was telling him and telling him and telling him and telling him. And now he's starting to, almost starting to believe it. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. Okay, I'm going to interrupt again for a second here. Hmm. What we're saying is Jesus died the second death, which is the death of sinners at the end. Go ahead. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath uh, there upon it is. him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Ellen White again deserves ages 753, paragraph 2. So Jesus died of a broken heart, which is another way of saying he died of separation from his Father, the source of life. He did not die of crucifixion. He didn't die of the beatings of the crown of thorns, any of that kind of stuff. He died of separation from his Father, and that is what will ultimately kill all the sinners at the end. In every situation, we need to take the larger, great controversy view when considering what to do. Think of Satan's accusations against God from the time of the rebellion in heaven all the way through human history to the elimination of evil at the third coming. Are we prepared to endure and stand tall for God's reputation in any given situation? Are we embarrassed to admit that we are Christians? Or Seventh-day Adventists? Every time we are tempted to sin, do we feel a terrible dread of separation from God? That's what, that's the way, that's what Christ felt. Terrible dread of being separated in the slightest way from his Father. That is what broke the heart of Jesus and caused his death. In Romans 14, 23, the last half, anything that is not based on faith is sin. sin. So that means that anything that is based on faith is the opposite of sin. Everything that we do or think is either moving us closer to God and is called faith or is moving us away from God and is called sin. 
Very simple, straightforward, very important definition. Without a doubt, the best example for us to follow is Jesus himself. In what sense was Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith? First, he is the only one who has finished the race in its fullest sense. The others, talked about in the previous chapter, have not yet reached their goal, Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. Jesus, however, has entered God's rest in heaven and is seated at the Father's right hand. We, together with these others, will reign with Jesus in heaven. And that's interesting. If you read carefully what it says there, they're waiting to experience People who died in the Old Testament, Paul says, are waiting to experience that being in God's presence. So that means they went to heaven at, at the point when they died or not. They didn't. This is a very, it's, I mean, if you, if you really read it carefully, it's a strong argument against the idea that people go straight to heaven when they die. Okay, Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, Jim? What a record all of these have won by their faith. Yet they did not receive what God had promised. There it is. Because God had decided on an even better plan for us. His purpose was that only in company with us would they be made perfect. Second, okay. it was actually Jesus' perfect life that made it possible for these others to run their race, Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 14. If Jesus had not come, the race of everyone else would have been futile, yeah. from the Bible study guide. Uh, Hebrews okay. 10, 5 to 14, for, the reason, for this reason, when Christ was about to come into the world, he said to God, you do not want sacrifices and offerings, but you have made, prepared a me, you have prepared a body for me. You are not pleased with animals burnt whole in the, on the altar. It was with sacrifices they take away, excuse me, or with sacrifices to take away sins. Now, didn't God command them to burn these, these sacrifices? Didn't he give all the instructions? We've already read about it. Previous lessons, the command is there. But Jesus says now he's not satisfied with these things. In fact, he's going to make it even worse than that. Go ahead. Then he said, Here am I to do your will, O God, just as it was written of me in the book of the law. First he said, You neither want nor are you pleased with sacrifices and offerings or with animals burnt on the altar and with sacrifices to take away sins. He said this even though all these sacrifices were offered according to the law. Then he said, Here am I, O God, do your will. God does away with all of the old sacrifices and puts the sacrifice of Christ in their place. Because Jesus Christ did what God wanted him to, to do, we are all purified from sin by the offering that he made of his own body once and for all. Okay, now here's the question. If blood of all those animals doesn't help, doesn't accomplish anything, why is it that the blood of Jesus does? Isn't blood blood? Yeah. Or is the difference is it's human blood as opposed to animal blood? Well, Romans says 5.10, it says that his, uh, was saved by his life or healed by his life. So mm -hmm. some of this stuff is really very pagan. Okay, well, so I mean, you're, you're getting at it. What's the, the point is that it's not some magic in red blood cells. The point is that it's the meaning of his death. The meaning of the animal sacrifices was not is, was different than the meaning of Christ's death. And if, if we don't understand why Christ had to die, then to a certain considerable extent, this, this is lost on us. Well, uh, the easy answer is he died for the remission of our sin. Ah, no, it's a byproduct of a greater mm -hmm. controversy. Mm -hmm. You see, he came to vindicate the character of God. Well, so. then if we understand the word remission, has to do with healing. It has to do with disease. And if you have a disease, what do you need? Forgiveness? No, you need healing. So that's what we, where the word, and that King James, I think, is the main one that uses that. Uh, I could be wrong there, but most of the translations now use forgiveness. Mm. It is not an issue of forgiveness. No, that is correct. It's, if, we all, if the sin is a disease, 
Forgiveness is not part of the equation. It may keep you from not feeling you know, bad or, or not yeah. feeling well. It may be being afraid of God. You don't need to be afraid. If he came and gave you the ultimate demonstration of how to live, and that is, remember what he says, the flesh counts for nothing. Mm -hmm. It's the words he has spoken that will be your judge. And, okay, and, uh, we need to keep moving. Yeah, cause verse, verse 11. Every Jewish priest performs his services every day and offers the same sacrifice many times. But these sacrifices can never take away sin. Christ, however, offered one sacrifice for sins, an offering that is effective forever. And then he sat down at the right hand of, of God. There he now waits until God puts his enemies <coughs> as a footstool under his feet, with one sacrifice then, he has made perfect forever those who are purified from sin. Okay, so let's summarize then. Christ's life and death answered the questions and the accusations that Satan had, had, had been giving since the time there was war in heaven. Started right up there. Animal sacrifices would never, could never answer those questions. No animal is able to raise himself from the dead. Jesus did, okay? So, Carrie, you want to pick up there? Yes. Finally, Jesus is the reason we have faith. As one with God, he expressed the faithfulness of God toward us. God never gave up in his efforts to save us. And that is why we will reach the reward in the end if we don't give up. Jesus ran with patience and remain faithful even when we were faithless. It's from 2 Timothy 2.13. Our faith is only a response to his faithfulness, and that's from the Adult Sabbath School Study Guide for Thursday, March 10. So are we prepared to stand up and take our place among the faithful and represent Jesus Christ correctly so that he can come again? Duane? <clears throat> By faith, you became Christ's, and by faith you are to grow up in him, by giving and taking. You are to give all, your heart, your will, your service. Give yourself to him to obey all his requirements. And you must take all, Christ, the fullness of all blessing, to abide in your heart, to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper, and to give you power to obey. Steps to Christ, Ellen White, 69 and 70. Charles, or you can go ahead, Duane. God never asks. God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. And this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. Mm. It is impossible for finite minds fully to comprehend the character or the works of the Infinite One. To the keenest intellect, the most highly educated mind, that holy being must ever remain clothed in mystery. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? Job 11, 7 and 8. And again, Steps to Christ, page 105, paragraphs 2 and 3. Let us remember that faith is based on evidence. Faith isn't evidence, it's based on evidence. We do not need to wait until the t truth has been fully demonstrated. We can trust God's word, the Bible. The Greek word pistis, translated faith, also means faithfulness. Are we prepared to be faithful to our Christian calling even if things go in unexpected ways? From the story of Habakkuk and the Old Testament to Hebrews 11, we have uh, seen e enough evidence and reasons to trust God no matter what happens in our day-to-day -day experience. What should we learn from the experience of people like Rahab? Joshua 2, 8 through 11. 
Go ahead, Charles. Before the spies settled down for the night, Rahab went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land. Everyone in the country is terrified of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea in front of you when you were leaving Egypt. We have also heard how you killed Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan. And let me interrupt there for a second. They also saw the children of Israel march on dry land through a flooded Jordan River right in front of them. Mm -hmm. they were there they were. <laughs> they thought they were safe because this huge flooded river was right there. No. <laughs> okay, go ahead. We were afraid as soon as we heard about it. We have all the lost our courage because of you. The Lord, your God, in heaven above and here on earth. We'd all, we should also note that special meaning of Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. How much of the universe was created by God's invisible word? From our study this week, how would you answer these questions? And I'm, I'm going to throw this out to you to think about. What do you think motivated Noah to build an ark in spite of the previous, of no previous floods or even any rain? What do you think motivated Abraham to set out for a country he had not previously seen or explored? Three, what do you think motivated Moses to exchange a prestigious life in the palace of Egypt for a miserable life with the Exodus generation? Those are questions from our adult Bible study guide. One of the few people mentioned that he was 11 and 12 that was not a hero of faith was Esau. Notice these words, let no one become immortal, immoral or unspiritual like Esau, who for a single meal sold his rights as the eldest son. That's of course his birthright. Did Esau really seek repentance? We can categorically say that God forgives in an unlimited way any number of times. But what Esau wanted, and I'm going to have to jump down here, what Esau wanted was not forgiveness. What Esau wanted was the blessings. And that's what he cared about. And Jacob, well, he wanted the spiritual blessings. He didn't want the material blessings. So Esau got what he wanted, and Jacob got what he wanted. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for this record from, of the many interesting characters involved with faith. We thank you especially for the example of Jesus and all that means to us. And now we ask for all those who are listening in to also have their minds exercised by what we have read and studied in these chapters that may bring each one of us closer to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.